This is the second Sunday that we've had a guest speaker, and it is my privilege to introduce Steve Gonzalez, who many of you know because he's worked with Miles for, uh, I believe, over nine years with Miles Ahead and Project Intercept and a lot of other uh, ministries that that, uh, they partnered on over the years. Um, Steve was a crusade director with Miles Ahead for five years, and um, he's an incredible man of God. He's an incredible teacher, and we are very blessed that he's pinch hitting for our pastor today. And uh, let's just let him know how much we appreciate him. Steve Gonzalez. How you guys doing? Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today because uh, you are a really good God. Father, thank you because uh, you love us and saved us and one day we get to spend eternity in heaven with you Uh, father thank you because you are who you are thank you that you brought miles safely through his surgery lord god and father i thank you for the incredible thing that you're doing here at the rock lord Uh, father thank you for how you're going to use this church in this city uh, how you're going to touch a lot of people lord and you're going to save a lot of young people and A lot of marriages are going to be restored because of what happens in this place. And Father, a lot of people are going to be uh, so encouraged and so lifted up that when they get married, they're not going to have to deal with some of that stuff because they're going to be taught and led to have a relationship with you and a relationship that helps them uh, look past all of those things, Lord, where divorce is not even an option because people are committed to you. Father, I thank you in advance for all that you're going to do here. And just praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, uh, <clears throat> very happy to be here with you guys this morning. Hi, uh, this is a complete change for me today. I spoke at a church last week down in South Bay. Oldest member is 104. Average age is like 70. <laughs> Those people loved me like I have never been loved before. Everybody was my grandma and everybody was my grandpa, you know what I'm saying? They just greeted me when I came in the door, and everybody made sure that they came and introduced themselves to me. So it was a really, really good time, but this is a total shift from that. Um, And then you guys were, there's just so much that I want to share with you guys, because I don't know if Miles is ever going to ask me to come back. So I I may stay up here for a while. Um, I heard you guys, when when you guys were singing that song about uh, saying how much you love Jesus and stuff, and he said when... You know, when you fall in love with somebody, that you, they, want to, they want to hear you say that and like, say it like you mean it and stuff. And I remember when my oldest daughter was in high school. She used to go to Horizon. And when her and I would have a bad morning and things just weren't going right, I would drop her off at school, right? Then I'd drive down to the corner, and I would stop my car in the middle of the street right there. I'd get out of my car, and I would scream, Christy, your dad loves you! As she's walking into school. <laughs> She would just duck her head like she didn't hear me, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't know whose dad that is. <laughs> Must be another Christy or something, it wasn't me. Uh, but anyway, it's just, it's good to be here with you guys today. I'm excited to see what God is doing here at The Rock. And uh, I want to thank Miles for allowing me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's an honor, it's a privilege uh, to be here with you guys. But most importantly, I'd like to thank God for allowing me the opportunity to speak on his behalf to his people it is an incredible responsibility to walk in and to get on the platform and to stand behind the pulpit and to say that I've prayed, that I've sought God, and this is what I believe God called me to say. That's an incredible thing. That's what the Bible says to be not many teachers. And one day in heaven, you know, I'll stand before God one day and he'll say, remember that day, that Sunday at Horizon? Was that me that asked you to speak that? And... As when Miles called and asked me to speak, I started praying and stuff, and, and two things came to my, to my heart and to my head, and I kind of battled with them all week, and, and I prayed, and I'm saying, okay, God, what is it that you would have me say here? And I talked to my wife, and, and I talked to my kids, and, and they would ask me, what are you going to speak about? And I would say, I'm not sure. You know, I'm praying over these two things, and, and usually when I get into that, into that situation where, where I'm not sure... I get, I get really irritable. You know what I'm saying? I don't want anybody to talk to me or anything because I want to hear from God. And I do not want to be interrupted. 
that's my time, and, and, and I'm not sure what I'm doing, and, and, and I need my time. And I just hate to be bothered. And I don't want to talk about basketball, and I don't want to talk about anything. It just doesn't matter at that time. I need to hear from God. And I remember a while back, I was living at this place, and the place we lived at was some uh, little sets of duplexes. And on one side of our house was some apartments, and the other side was other apartments. And the people that lived in these apartments would use our place as a shortcut from one to the other. And one day, it's Sunday after church in the morning, and, and we come home in the afternoon, and I'm sitting inside my house, and it's one of those kind of days where I just, I didn't want to be bothered. And all of a sudden, I hear this crashing, incredible crashing sound. And I walk outside, and there's these two little young gangsters kicking my fence down because the landlord had just put up a new fence to keep people from walking across the lot, right? So I walk outside, and they got the fence in one hand, and they're just kicking it, bam, trying to kick it down because it's blocking their shortcut. So I walk up to him, and I said, uh, what are you doing? One of them looks at me, he says, I'm kicking your fence down, man. <laughs> I said, what? He says, I'm kicking your fence down, man. I says, you can't be kicking my fence down. It's not right, you know what I'm saying? I go, you can't be kicking my fence. He goes, man, I'll shoot you. I said, you're going to do what? He said, I'm going to shoot you. I'll go get my homeboys, I'll shoot you. I go, is that right? I'm in the flesh now, you know what I'm saying? I just forgot about what the pastor preached about. I said, is that right? He says, yeah. I said, you wait right there. I'm coming over right now. So I jumped in my car, right? My, my blood is boiling now, man. I jump in my car, take off out of my driveway, drive across, and they're running down the street, two of them, really fast, right? So I take off right I'm praying for them while all this is happening, all right? <laughs> so I drive down to the corner really fast, right? I jump out of my car. This biker comes up in his motorcycle. He doesn't know me. i never seen him before. He drives up, parks, says, what's happening now? What's happening? He goes, let's get him, let's get him, you know, so they run up. So here I am, this Christian guy, right, with this bike around his Harley, these two young Mexican gangsters, and we're going to fight, right? Because they interrupted me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's serious business, you know what I'm saying? Don't interrupt me when I'm talking or something. <laughs> Trying to get a hold of God. <laughs> I don't want to be interrupted. <laughs> I get kind of rude sometimes when I get interrupted. And my wife holds me in check. And when I shared this message with her and what it was about, I had just been rude with my son because <laughs> he interrupted me. <laughs> so I said, I know, I know. God just convicted me too, and I know. I want to talk to you today about the interruptible God or a day in the life of Jesus. Jesus is our ultimate role model. Jesus was constantly being interrupted. His life was a series of interruptions. And, you know, I work for a ministry called Young Life. I'm the co-area director down in South Bay. I work with young people go to jails and speak. I work as a consultant for the sheriff's department for a few different schools. And when I started my job, I went and I took a course with uh, Stephen Covey called First Things First on how to order and structure my day. Any of you guys taken that? No? Save your money. <laughs> it worked for me for about a week. My life is a series of interruptions. And so was Jesus' life. Matthew chapter 9, if you have your Bible this morning. Word. Word. Oh, okay. Word? <laughs> Must be a cultural thing that you guys got going here. You know? <laughs> Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 1. The interruptible God, or a day in the life of Jesus. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, 
Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, get up, take up your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowds, when the crowds saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to men. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skin will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. While he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. As Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if, only, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. When Jesus entered the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd. He said, go away. The girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread throughout all that region. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over the region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been done in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. And Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the, the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. A day in the life of Jesus, the interruptible God. You read the preceding chapters to this, and if you read it carefully, notice the time segments that are taking place. When he goes to sleep, when he gets up, different things. Jesus has crossed over the lake. He deals with a man that's demon-possessed in the graveyard. And he heals him, and the demons go into the pigs and stuff. They run off the cliff. Jesus gets inside of a boat, goes back to the other side of the lake over there. He has had a full night. Disciples are kind of going nuts because they think the boat is going to sink, and all kinds of stuff is happening. He gets his one moment of sleep, and his disciples wake him up in the middle of it because they're afraid. He gets to the other side, and his day begins. I don't know about you. I don't know what, day, what time of day your day begins. Some people, it's really early. They have a, that type of schedule, and they're up at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. Maybe they work for UPS or somebody or whatever it is they do. They get up early, and they go out. Some of us start at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. I don't know what time Jesus' day started, but his day begins. And... I look at this 
thing, and it says, Jesus stepped to him into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Jesus is coming home to the place where he lived, where he grew up. Now, I don't know if he was there possibly to visit his mom, maybe. Maybe they, he was there just to check in and see how things are going. See how Joseph's carpenter shop is doing. See how his brothers and sisters are doing. Maybe he just needs time away. Too much stuff is coming at him. I don't know. I'm guessing. But he's coming home. He gets off the boat and automatically something happens. I don't know if he had plans before then, but if he did, his plans just went right out the window. And I don't know how many of you that has ever happened to you. When you've got your day all figured out. And you know that by the end of today, you have to get these certain things accomplished. And the telephone rings. The kids fall down. One of them gets hurt. You lost your homework. Whatever it is happened. Everything begins to happen. And your plans just went down the drain. This is what happens to Jesus. His whole day is gone. First situation, these guys bring this paralytic man to him. He's sick. They brought him. They took the time. Jesus looks at them and says, you know what? I'm going to heal him. You guys believed enough that I had the ability to do this, that you brought him to me from wherever you came. You brought him to me. I'll take time out of my day to do that. And Jesus begins to deal with him. And Jesus is going to make him well. Then his second issue comes up. Now he's got religious people upset at him. The Pharisees, the religious teachers, don't like the words that he used. And they're going to play word games with him. So Jesus has to stop from healing this man that's already messed up his schedule. Now to deal with these other guys that don't like the way he's going to take care of the healing. Got interrupted again. All he wanted to do was do good. And somebody didn't like it. That ever happened to you? When you just want to help somebody and somebody's got a cut in the middle of it to try to mess that up? Happened to me last week. Have this young guy that I'm working with that's in jail. Not too far from here. 18 years old. His mom died when he was 8 years old. His dad could be any one of five people, so they tell him. He has no idea who his dad is. Eight years old, goes into the foster care system all the way through. It's all he's ever known. When he's 15 years old, he runs away from home, runs to New York. Ends up getting a job in a restaurant as a dishwasher. Somebody in the restaurant likes him, and they begin to teach him how to cook. Really fancy restaurants, they have one of those kind of guys that makes all the sauces and stuff for the food. You know what he, what's called, a sous chef? Yeah. That's what he, that's what they're teaching him to do that. He's doing really well. Something happens, he comes back to San Diego, gets in trouble with the law, ends up back in jail, but the guy is a cook in his heart. He's a chef. He's got the touch. That's his thing. He knows, because that's what he is, about this school, and there's only two of them in the nation. One's in San Francisco, one's in New York City. The Culinary Arts Academy. It is the place. It's you graduate from there and you can go to the Cordon Bleu and go higher than that. He applies for this school. They do an interview with him in jail on the telephone. The school accepts him, gives him a $10,000 ship, a $10,000 scholarship, never having seen him. The only thing is that he needs $250 by Friday as a registration fee for this school. He's getting out in 23 days. School starts in July. The jail calls me and says, is there any way you can help us with this? I said, let me sit down and talk with them. They get him out of jail. I drive out to Alcohol. We sit in a Carl's Jr. and we have lunch and we just talk about life, about where he's at and all these different things. And I say, do you want to do this? And he says, yeah. I says, I'll pay the 250 I don't have it, but I'll get it. I'll ask somebody. <laughs> I beg. <laughs> Gets a big old smile on his face. He tells me, Steve, when I was 10 years old, they put me in a foster care with a Lutheran pastor and his wife and his kids. He says, I couldn't deal with it. It was so foreign to the way that I lived. I could not handle it. He said, but that lady writes to me. He said, and I know she's been praying for me for every day since she met me. 
He said, and I believe what God is doing in my life started way back then. Finish our meeting. I go and I make a few phone calls and I call this pastor that I'm working with. And I said, look, man, here's a story. I need 250 bucks. He says, give me a few minutes. He made a couple of calls, called me back and says, okay, you got your 250 bucks. So I called the jail and I said, okay, I got his money. Where do I send it? They said, send it to us. We'll put it in our program and then we'll send the check. I'm not trying to get glory for anybody. You know what I'm saying? But I ain't giving it to nobody else either. God gets the glory for that. You know what I'm saying? Not somebody else's program. So I said, I don't think so. I said, why don't you give me the address and I'll send it. And they said, okay. They gave me the address, address and we sent it. All I was trying to do was help somebody. And somebody else wants to get involved in it. Jesus is trying to help this man and the Pharisees get involved, and they want to play word games with him. And they interrupt him in the course of him doing what God has called him to do, which is help people. Jesus leaves that place, and as he's walking away, it says that in verse 9, and Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll collector's booth, follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Jesus is walking, finishes dealing with those guys, walks out, as he's going by, because Jesus is a forward-thinking kind of guy, he walks out, sees Matthew, looked past everything else that people had seen and said, you know what? You're mine. Come on, let's go. And he stops because he's keeping the big picture in mind that ministry is about people. Ministry is not about the platform. Ministry is not about playing the music and all that kind of stuff and being in front of people. That is not ministry. Ministry is about people about people that have issues and all kinds of stuff. And somehow Jesus looked into Matthew and said, you know what, there is something in this man that I am going to be able to mold and shape and make him a minister to people. So he took time out of his day to bring him on board as well. Jesus leaves from there, walking down the street. He calls Matthew. Matthew says, would you come to my house for dinner? Still hasn't got home to see his family yet, if that's where he was there. He was coming home for something. Still not there. Matthew says, would you come home? He says, okay. Goes over to Matthew's house, sits there, and they begin to eat. Here come all the sinners, the tax collectors. Everybody comes inside the house, and Jesus is dealing with them. All the issues that they have, all the questions that they must have, because they don't get to sit with people like him. They're unclean. They're dirty people. They don't get to sit with a rabbi. They don't get to sit with a teacher of his standing. They're not good enough. But Jesus takes time out of his day to say, okay, I'll sit and eat with you guys. That's okay. Sits down with them, begins to deal with them, the issues that they got. Here come the religious people again and interrupted him while he's doing this good deed and start asking, why? Okay, you healed that guy over there and you said some words that were kind of questionable and we cut you some slack on that one. Now we come over here and you got this guy over here. These, you're having dinner with all these guys over here. How come? They're asking his disciples. Jesus overhears them, and Jesus deals with that issue as well. Goes and explains all of this stuff to them. He finishes doing that. John's disciples come through the door. John's in jail. He messed up. Said the wrong thing to the wrong person or about the wrong person. Put him in jail. His disciples want to come and find out, okay, what's happening over here? Jesus, why aren't your disciples doing this? Interrupted again. Jesus stops dealing with these people, turns around and deals with these people and answers the questions that they have. He finishes doing that one. Actually, the Bible says in verse 18, while he was saying this, a ruler came inside the house. Now Jairus, Jairus comes, who's a ruler in the synagogue, and Jairus' daughter's sick. So Jesus has just barely finished saying this. Here comes this other guy. My daughter's sick. Would you come into my house and make her well? Or did it say that she died? She died. 
Jesus, you're having this conversation with the living over here. My daughter's dead over there. Would you stop what you're doing here and go fix somebody that's dead? So he says, okay. This is Covey's thing is totally out the window. You know what I'm saying? Because the time management thing tells you that you prioritize your schedule. You've got A, B, C's, D's, and E's, and all the way down. Then you put an A1, A2, A3, and all, then B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3. And you go all the way down the list. Now, I guarantee you that healing dead girl was not on the schedule that day. You know what I'm saying? But it came in to the middle. So Jesus says, okay, let's go. So Jesus gets up, starts walking out the door. And as he's going to raise this girl from the dead, another lady comes walking down the street. She's had an issue of blood for 12 years, spent all her money, the Bible says, and nobody could make her well. She sees him walking down the street, and this thought creeps into her mind. If I just touch the hem of his garment, everything is going to be okay. So she comes up to him. He's just walking. She grabs him. The Bible says that he knew that virtue, something had left his body, and he stops. He said, who touched me? The disciples, in one of the other Gospels, the disciples says, Lord, how are we supposed to know that you're surrounded by all these people? Jesus says, she's here. Find her. They find the woman. She comes down, falls at his feet, and Jesus stops, and he deals with her. Because she's got issues, too. He gets her all straightened up and everything, tells her everything's going to be okay, everything's fine and everything. Gets up, and then he starts on his road again. Gets to Jairus' house, opens up the door. In those days, they would have professional mourners. If you had a lot of money, you could hire people that would come and cry for you. <laughs> they would, if you had a lot of money, you'd buy a lot of whalers. You know what I'm saying? Look like you're real popular. Everybody loved you and stuff. You know? <laughs> I better have a lot of money. You know what I'm saying? So people could come and cry for me. He comes in and all of these people are crying inside of the room. And he stops and he deals with them. They laughed at him. They laughed at him. And he says, get him out of the room. So he's got to wait till all of these people get out of the room. Then he goes over. He gets the little girl up. He picks her up. Brings her back to life. Finishes there. Says, as Jesus went out from there, he finds two blind men outside waiting for him. Walking down the street, the two guys start yelling at him. They're yelling, have mercy on us, son of David. He hears them yelling at him. The Bible doesn't say he stopped that time. He kept walking. Then the Bible says that he went indoors. And when he went inside, then they came to him. I wonder how come. I wonder why he didn't stop like he did with the lady that had the issue of blood. I wonder how come he didn't stop for them the way he stopped dealing with the tax collectors and those guys to do this. I don't know why. When we get to heaven, we'll ask him. But he didn't. They come inside the house or wherever they were at, and Jesus healed them. He finishes healing them. It says, while they were going out, Another demon-possessed guy walks inside the door. He's got an evil spirit that he can't speak. And Jesus deals with him. He still hasn't got wherever he's going. He's going every place else. Dealing with all these different issues. He walks, the Bible says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I said all that to simply say this. You are not an interruption to God. You ever felt like you're a bother? You ever felt like, you know what? I know Pastor Miles doesn't want to hear this anymore. 
I know that. Man, I've been dealing with this issue for so long. I know they're sick and tired of hearing about this. I know that these people don't want to hear about how my relationship with my husband is going anymore. He wasn't treating me right two years ago, and I was complaining then. He's not treating me right now. And every week when they ask me, how's it going? I say the exact same thing. I know they're getting tired. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I know that sometimes I don't want to bother God anymore. I've been asking him to change me for 18 years. I get so frustrated with myself sometimes because I don't want to be interrupted sometimes. I got a life too. What about me? What about my situations? And I get into this trip. I don't want to be bothered by other people's stuff anymore. And I start feeling sorry for myself. I take my eyes and I look at, at life through my perspective. I don't pray the way I pray sometimes and I say, God, help me to see people the way you see them. Help me to hear people the way you hear them. And help me to love people the way you love them. I don't want to do that. And sometimes I just, I just don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with, with the kids that I meet that are getting sexually abused. The ones like last year whose dad was burning her up the inside of her thigh and on her stomach with a hot edge of a knife so she would keep her mouth shut. Sometimes I get tired of that stuff. I don't want to hear it anymore. And I, that's my flesh. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I just say, you know what? I'm not going to bother God anymore. He's got to be tired too. He must get tired like I do. And I don't want to bring it to him anymore. It's my deal Da, those are the cards that were dealt to me in life. I just got to deal with it. It's the way it is. No use crying over spilt milk. It ain't going to make it any better anyway. You suck it up. Deal with it. And I don't want to bring it to God anymore. But Jesus is the interruptible God. You can come to him with everything that troubles you, with the uh, things in life that cause you so much pain, so much stress, and so much heartache, you can bring that stuff to him, and it's okay to interrupt him. See, he's not like me that's going to get mad. He's not going to be like me that says, you know what, I could see you on Friday. Because according to my Stephen Covey book that I carry, I can't fit you into my schedule till then. See, Jesus doesn't carry one of those. You can interrupt his day. That's what he's about. He's about ministering to you and I. Let me, as I close, let me share with you how important it is for him that you interrupt his day. This is how important it is to him. In Hebrews 1.14, it says that the angels in heaven are ministering angels to come 
to assist the heirs of salvation. That's you and I. The angels were created to help us. There is a book that my daughter read at Horizon in one of her English classes called Deadline. And it's written by this guy named Frank something. And he talks about heaven and what it's like. He dies and goes to heaven. And in heaven, he meets his guardian angel that watched him through life. That was there protecting him because the Bible says in Matthew that you do have angels assigned to you. Hebrews says that they are ministering agents on your behalf and my behalf. They are there to help us through situations in life. But Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is saying, the angels are there for you, and that's good. But when you have those things in life, you know what? Interrupt me. Interrupt my life with the things that, you know what? You just can't deal with anymore. Interrupt his life with it. Sometimes the angel isn't good enough. I'm sorry. The angel was good enough to come and deliver Hezekiah from all those people and killed a hundred and something thousand of them in the middle of the night. That's good enough for Hezekiah. God bless him. The angels were good enough when Elijah was in a messed up situation, him and his servant, and they needed help, and the servant is afraid, and Elijah says, God, open his eyes so he can see that there are more for us than against us, and God opens up his eyes, and he sees thousands of angels surrounding them, and everything is going to be okay. That's good enough for them. You know what? Sometimes I need Jesus. I don't know about you. I need Jesus in my life. I need him to help me to teach me how to be a good husband. Because, man, after almost 23 years, I still can't get it right. And I have a choice. I can be married or I can be right. <laughs> I want to be married. <laughs> so I need God to help me to teach me how to be a husband. You know what I'm saying? You know, I don't have to be the head of my house. You know, I told my wife yesterday where <laughs> I told I wasn't going to tell no stories about her today. So but she's a Christian. She has to forgive me. We were eating ice cream yesterday, right? We we're doing some yard work and stuff, and we're eating ice cream. And I always wanted to say this. Cause my wife will slap me, but I just, it just, you know, I just wanted to say it. I wanted to be a man. So I, I finished my ice cream. I eat my ice cream really fast. And I look at her, and I said, give me that ice cream. She looked at me like, shut up. <laughs> give me that ice cream. I just wanted to say that once. I knew I wasn't going to get it or anything, you know. <laughs> thought she was going to hit me, but I need him to teach me how to be a husband. I need Jesus to teach me how to be a dad. And I blow it as a dad. I love my kids. And so bad, man, so bad I want my kids to be able to look back at life and say, you know what? I want to come home for Christmas. I want to come home for Easter and it's summertime when I'm in college. I want to come home because my house is a good place. And my dad is a good guy. And my mom is a good lady. I want to come home. And sometimes I'm doing stuff that I know my kids ain't going to want to come home. Because I'm being a jerk. I'm being stupid. And at times like that, I have to come to God and say, you know what, Jesus, you're the only one that's going to be able to do this in my life. I don't need anybody counseling me. I know the word just as well as they do. And you use men, I understand that. And you use women to encourage me and stuff like that. But you know what, Jesus, can I interrupt your day today? Would you take some time and deal with me? Would you help me? And you know what? He loves me. 
don't know if you've ever felt it. But I will remember for the rest of my life, like if it was yesterday, being on a plane with Miles from Washington State to Washington, D.C., sitting on that plane and reading John 17 over and over again. And when I walked off that plane, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that God was my dad. I knew it. I knew it. And I knew that whatever happened in my life, that it was going to be okay because I could interrupt his schedule. That he was never too busy for me. And maybe you're here today and you wonder, is there any hope? You know what? There is. Because you can interrupt his day. And he won't get mad at you. You just have to ask him. Why don't we bow our heads and pray? Lord, I think of your word that says that I can come and cast all my cares upon you because you care for me. Lord, I, I stop and I, I think about how you are bombarded daily with literally millions and millions of people calling out to you and asking you for help. And Lord, I'm amazed that you are so big that you can stop and you can deal with every single issue regardless of how big or how small it is. And that you have the ability to make it right. Father, I thank you that when Moses and the people were at the edge of the Red Sea and they were about to be destroyed. I thank you that you came and you parted the Red Sea and you brought your people to safety. Lord, I thank you that as the Jews are being sentenced to death, you made time to hear Esther's prayer and you honored it and you gave her favor before the king and you brought deliverance for your people I thank you father that in the midst of the fiery furnace you were interruptible enough for those people Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego Lord God you allowed them to come before you and you delivered them your name was lifted up because of it. And Father, I pray today because there are people in this place, Lord God, that are carrying situations and they're wondering if it's ever going to be better. And I thank you because today you're going to make it better for them. I thank you, Father, that even though um, maybe other people are tired of hearing it, and I thank you that um, that even though um, even though they're so frustrated God with the situation I thank you that you brought them to this place so that they could turn to you Father because the deliverance that you work for them is going to be huge and the only person that's going to be able to get the praise and the glory is you while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed maybe you're here today and you're here for the very first time and 
you wonder about your life, where you fit and who you fit with. You don't have to search any longer. If you're looking for a friend that will never leave you nor forsake you, if you're looking for someone that's not going to hurt you and someone that's not going to reject you when you have things happening in your life and you need somebody to talk to, you came to the right place. His name is Jesus. He loves you so much that he did something so incredible that if you were to read it in a book, you would believe somebody had made it up. Maybe nobody's ever loved you that way before. He loved you so much. He let people laugh at him and spit on him and hit him. They mocked him. They stripped him of his clothes. He was naked to everybody. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed him to a cross by his hands and his feet. They stuck a spear in his side. And in the midst of all his pain and agony, in the midst of everything that is happening to him, he allowed himself to be interrupted at that time to save the thief that was next to him on the cross. He made time for him even in the midst of all of that. And he makes time for you as well. God loves you. He's not bothered by you. He created you. And if you're here today and you want to make it right between you and him, you're just a prayer away. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I know that I have sinned against you. I've done stuff and I've said stuff and I've been human. I've been mean to people. I've lied, I've stolen, cheated on my income tax, cheated on my wife, cheated on my girlfriend. Jesus, would you please forgive me? Would you help me? Would you heal my heart? And help me be the man, help me be the woman that I'm supposed to be. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And I ask you to help me to live for you. Jesus, please help me to understand how much you love me. And help me to love you more tomorrow than I do today because I don't feel that today. But help me to grow in my relationship with you. Thank you for taking all that pain for me. Thank you for loving me that much. And thank you for making me feel like I'm not an interruption to you. Thank you that I'm special to you. Father, thank you for today. Thank you because you love us. Thank you because we never tire you out. Father, I pray for the people in this church. I pray that you would encourage them, that you would help them to be incredible ministers for you. Help them to love people. Father, help us so that people wouldn't be an interruption in our lives, Lord God. We're called to ministry because of people, not in spite of people, Lord. Help us to love people the way you love them, to hear them the way you hear them, to speak to them the way you speak to them. And Lord, help us to live a life that brings honor and glory to you. Father, thank you for everything. We thank you and we praise you.
In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you repeated that prayer, there is a prayer room out there. Ask the ushers on the way out. Do not leave here unless you talk to somebody. God loves you. Thank you very much. God bless you and have an incredible week.